Welcome to Positive Recovery MD. If you're listening, chances are you want to create happiness around you and thrive in your life. We're glad you're here and you've come to the right place. This podcast will inspire and motivate you to not merely survive your recovery journey, will give you the tools to build or strengthen your foundation to thrive and flourish in your life. Each week, we'll come together as a community to have authentic conversations around addiction, recovery, and what matters, growth and progress, not perfection, all while developing positive habits for you to utilize in your life. To learn more, please visit PositiveRecoveryMD.com to sign up to receive the daily positive interventions that we'll review, as well as gain access to exclusive Positive Recovery content available only to Positive Recovery MD listeners. All right, let's get started. Welcome, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, to another installment of Positive Recovery MD podcast with Julie DeNova, myself, and Colleen Offers, which is great. We have a local celebrity. She is the Positive Recovery Center Hill Country Executive Director. She is licensed as a chemical dependency counselor in Texas. She's been working in the field, I don't know, forever. She has, <laughs> <laughs> she has an associate's in human services and a Bachelor of Science in Interdisciplinary Studies with a minor in communication from U of H. And she's currently a Red Raider in school getting a Master's of Science in Addiction Counseling. One unique thing about her is that she studied theater at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in Los Angeles. Welcome, Colleen Offers. Thank you. Welcome. I'm glad to be here. Yes, and you look really pretty. I don't know why you didn't <laughs> you at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, but hopefully we'll get to that. So, um, yeah, we're going to ask you to tell your story. But first, uh, you are the executive director of our new facility out in Spicewood, which is so awesome. Every time I go there, I want to relapse. Like, it's just, I love it. <laughs> Tell us about your program, what's cool about it, and then we'll ask you what what, what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. Okay. Um, so, we are a 24-bed facility located in beautiful Spicewood, Texas. My favorite thing about this facility, other than, you know, just the layout, there's like such a spiritual component here. Um, I've heard it from the staff. I experience it. And from the clients that we've served up to this point, that's been like the huge thing. Like it's so peaceful. It's so quiet. It's such a great place to hear God um, and, and just really be healing and, and feeling all of that energy. We do use positive recovery um, developed by Dr. Jason Powers, who is also here with me on this show. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he, he, is. he is. You know, the thing that I like the most about positive recovery is that it's a strength-based approach, you know, and it it focuses on using people's strengths to help them flourish in recovery. So like, how are we going to find meaning and purpose in our lives? How are we going to, you know, PERMA, positivity, engagement, relationships, meaning and achievement? You know, and, and if I can, if I can hit all of those things, then I'm really going to build a life that doesn't require me to, to escape from it. Yeah. Yeah. The, the facility out there, the, there's a, there's a nice walking, walking trail around the, the perimeter of the facility. And, and it's just so nice. It really is so peaceful. When I, when I did the training out there a couple of weeks, weekends ago, I just, uh, it was, I was, it was shocking how out of breath I was because like, the landscape <laughs> it's kind of, it's really like it goes down to you know and sometimes it goes down to where water might be if there's enough rain you know it's like really close <laughs> to like travis and um man it's just yeah you're lucky you're lucky yeah. to be out there it's, it's okay. beautiful um i saw a fox for the first time a few days ago i'd never what? seen one before what does the fox say <laughs> well, this bird. fox was eating a bird. Oh, nice. He didn't seem at all bothered that I was standing there. He just kept looking at me and then finally ran off when I tried yeah, to get yeah. closer, but it was pretty cool. Well, speaking of transformation, you've got a really interesting story. I don't know many people uh, <laughs> personally who were sort of on a like DEA watch list or the <laughs> FBI's most wanted or, or something, you know, like real crime, true stories. I don't know what to like. Tell us what it was like. I know you're celebrating tomorrow, 11 years, or was and that last month? That was last month. Okay. Um, so I just celebrated 11 years. Mazel tov. Thank you. Where it ended was not like so much the whole totality of it. You know, looking back over my story, it was it was really long that I was actively in addiction. And I grew up in a recovering family. I had a, I had a seat waiting for me. I chose to go ahead and get there myself. But, you know, I started dabbling with 
drugs and alcohol when I was probably 15 years old. And, you know, I managed, then I didn't manage. I went to AA. I didn't really do any of the stuff that you were supposed to do. Like I, I was really good at going and getting a boyfriend. Um, I was really good at, you know, fellowshipping. I don't think I ever remember working a step, but I had like the token sponsor, you know, like the person that you hung out with on Friday night and you're like, oh, this is my sponsor. But What's I the never- only thing that addicts do in moderation? Um, step work. No. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, it progressively got worse, you know, and, and, and there was a, there was a time when I was in my teenage years where I did, I was a club kid. Um, and you know, I don't know if anybody was alive or participating in the club scene back in the late eighties, early nineties in Houston, but it was a big deal. And yeah, I moved out of my house and, and I was at the clubs, um, and everything that went with that, you know, and, So what what were you using exactly? Like, what did you start with? Was there a progression? My first substance I ever tried was cocaine. So my dad was in the deep end. Right Right in the deep end. So my dad worked in the field. um, And so, uh, you know, there was kind of a little bit of kind of like bringing the preacher's kid, right? So it was like, okay, if I'm going to have to be part of this recovery thing, I'm going to go big. And so that's what I did. I went and got a bunch of cocaine and stole my, my mom's a real estate agent, stole her real estate key. It was like this long key back then and went into one of her listings that was empty and spent a couple of days just getting high. Wait, wait, hold on. Is this, so what you're trying to tell me is, yeah, like your dad was in recovery. He's working in the field. Your thought process was, if I'm going to like do this, I'm going to go get a big bag of really heavy drugs and I'm going to isolate and use by myself. No, I had somebody with me. Oh. <laughs> Okay, but up to up to the being with somebody else or not, that's that's an ex, that's pretty extreme, right? Well, and it is, but you know, at the same time, like my dad was like already convinced that I was using, and, and oh. there had been like a going around process, and I, I mean, no matter what I said or did, like he didn't believe me. I was in denial, and and it's funny because you know, the, back in the eighties, people just sent their kids to treatment. Like there were so many kids getting sent to treatment and for a long periods of time. And I did struggle with depression and stuff like that. And I'm sure like looking back now, I know it mimicked, like now that I know enough about what addiction looks like, I know that my behavior mimicked it, but my thought processes go big or go home. Like if, if you're a is- teenage girl, every teenage girl fulfills every diagnostic criteria. I don't care. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Thank God we don't live in the 80s anymore where they just take whoever to treatment right. and keep them there, right? Like right. that's one of the lessons that we learned, thank God, and that we're able to give better treatment today than they did back then because we learned from those mistakes, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. But he didn't send you and he just was like, You're using, you're lying. No, so I went to treatment. Oh, I went to treatment. Wait, wait, wait. Before you started using them. Really? Yeah. You yeah. he made you go to treatment, you were sober. Yeah. Okay, stop skipping over the juicy parts, Colleen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, I did. I did several stints in um, Parkside Lodge, actually. God, I, I would resent my parents so, I would be filled with so much anger. I'd probably use over it. So I did. I I, I did I can, for a long I time. I can see that. Yeah, so I did for a long time. And, um, you know, after the, the, the time I went before the cocaine, you know, it was like, you know, it was kind of like a screw you like, yeah. okay, whatever, like we're going to play this game and this is how this is going to be. So gotcha. Um, I learned a lot. Yeah. About Colleen's things. always been a rebel for sure. I have. And then I have. more, more affectionately, she has other terms that people use also something to do with sassy, but you know, <laughs> uh, she definitely is sometimes a rebel without a cause, but <laughs> some of that comes into so much, you know, into play now and how she advocates and helps other people. And I'm sorry for jumping in on your story, but Your story is pretty amazing. And I can't, you know, if you could just help us to see like how, like how you went through it, because man, it was interesting. It was interesting. Um, You know, I have a lot of, I I think I'm a better counselor because of all, like my story makes me a better counselor. You know, um, I I experienced what it was like as a teenager to, to go to treatment. And then again, as a young adult, you know, I've been a family member. I'm an adult child of an alcoholic. I've been in a relationship with an addict. I've had children that have struggled with addiction. So it's like, I get to be at every seat at the table and I know what it feels like. So I, I really think that helps a lot. Yeah. But I was angry. Like, man, I was mad. Okay. So you start using, I start using cocaine leads to 
I so moved out of my house. So like, it was like, we came like this happened, you know, and, um, I was just like, okay, I'm leaving. I'm not going to live here. Cause I'm not going back to rehab. And he's like, you're not going to live under my roof. And so my mother being the fabulous Alan on that she was, <laughs> cause I got kicked out of the school district, not just the school, but the district. Wait, how? Uh, because the person that I was, <laughs> the person, because of what happened that weekend, like the person I was with, I was, I was at school with, I met him at school. We took off for the weekend. Some people on the bus had accused us of doing some stuff. Um, I'm pretty oh. sure he did, selling drugs and I'm pretty sure he did sell the drugs, but oh. I didn't know about it. But regardless, okay. since I was with him, we both got Kicked asked. out of the district. The That's district. great. Okay. Yeah. So now so, your Al-Anon mom says, come on home. And my mom says, okay, so let's go find this private school. My mom and my dad found this private school in Houston. I don't remember what it was called, but it was like, you only had to go like 20 hours a week or something ridiculous. Uh, yeah, and I know so that. my mom went and got me an apartment and I was like 16 years old, Oh, which was like the perfect storm. And it was right down, like in the heart of the club, the club area down off Westheimer yes. and Richmond over there. So. You're living on. by yourself. Yeah, I bet. Oh, I wasn't living by myself. Everybody moved in with me because my mom was paying for it. Oh. So I had like all <laughs> these people living there and this one room apartment. It was horrible. Like, Who are half these people? I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah. okay. So you're doing the, you're doing the club scene. You're underage. I'm sure, you know, so then what happens? Um, so when I, th that went pretty bad, pretty fast, you know, um, it, it was clubbing every night. It was ecstasy all the time, acid all the time cocaine all the time. Um, I'm sure I was drinking too. I just don't remember that being like front and center at that time, but you know, it, anything and everything, there wasn't one particular drug. I was like the perfect example of poly substance abuse back then. Like if, if it was there, I did it. You were on everything, but roller skates, everything, but roller skates. And I'm sure I was on roller skates sometimes now. Uh, so when I was 17, my mom, you know, just broke down and was like, please, please, like you're going to die. One of those things. And I, I, I felt properly guilted. And so I agreed to go to a halfway house or it was like the long term residential program in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, and it was right after I turned 17, because I remember it was an adult woman program and they took me just just because I just turned 17. And I, I was there for six months, finished that program. I came home for a month or two, but then decided to go back to Omaha to finish my aftercare program there for a year. Um, and you finished high school there? Uh, no, no, no. I, I graduated with I graduated with my GED. No, I I quit school shortly after I decided to move out. Yeah. Um, because 20 hours a week, I, I didn't show up at that class at all. So we made a deal that if I, I could quit as long as I took my GED, like the week later, which I did. And so that was that was over and that was done. And she even bought me a graduation present. <laughs> I will never forget. It was a pair of riding boots. It was so cool. But yeah, so then I, I when I went to Nebraska, I, I was there. I stayed a year. So I was there pretty much close to two years between the year, the, the six months I was in treatment and then the year of aftercare. But I ended up relapsing up there. A good part of my my story, my routine, um, my MO was to fall in love. You know, I was really good at going to treatment and finding a boyfriend. I was really good at going to meetings and finding a boyfriend. Um, and if I wasn't doing either of those, I was really good at finding an alcoholic or addicted boyfriend. And so I found me one of those at my job up there in Nebraska, much older guy. He was an alcoholic, moved in with him and you know everything was going to be perfect and great until Did it wasn't. You married? Did you marry him? No, I did not marry him. Um, I, I was living with an active alcoholic trying to work a program of recovery. So that didn't go really good. You know, like I went, I, I was like a year or so over a little over a year sober. And it was a, it was a total nightmare. And I ended up going out and drinking. And I think I stayed out for like a week. And then I asked my parents to come get me because I just didn't want to live there anymore. If I just went home, it would be better. You know, it, it was now it was Nebraska. That was the problem. <laughs> like Omaha was the problem. So I needed to go back to Houston. Oh, but that's great. You, you, you caught it only after a week. So you come back to Houston and oh. You get back in recovery or do you, no? Nope. Um, started drinking. That's when I really, like, my alcoholism really kind of took off then. Got a job working at a restaurant, drinking all the time. Um, and so I had a big episode. I guess I'd been there probably four or five months. And I got really, really, a, a friend of mine and I got really, really drunk one night and blacked out. Like, was totally still walking, talking, driving, apparently. I don't know how good I was doing at it. I remember coming to in the parking lot of a Chili's 
and the I, I was working at Chili's at the time, but not that Chili's. And the manager was trying to get us home, but we couldn't remember where we lived. Like, so we're in this car and neither of us can remember where we lived. I did remember I worked at Chili's. Um, and so he was somehow able to get my emergency contact number. So he called my mom to come, <laughs> to come get me at two in the morning. And that did not go well. And so my solution to that was I was going to move to Minnesota. Because if I just got out of Houston, then I would go to Minnesota and I would be okay. Geographic cure. Okay. Yeah. That so didn't work. So I was <laughs> in Minnesota about 18 months. I was just telling this story to my boyfriend the other day because we were going through the snow apocalypse um, and we were up driving back from Taos. And um, I'll never forget it because I really, when I meant it, like when I said, I'm going to go to Minnesota and I'm going to pull it together, I really meant I was. Like in my mind, if I just got there, I would somehow be okay. And the first weekend I was there, maybe it was the second weekend, I ended up going and getting a job at Chili's up there. And I went out with a bunch of the people from work, 20 years old. I wasn't old enough to drink. And I got on the roads and it was, it was late. It was like one o'clock in the morning, ice, snow. And I was driving down the freeway and I hit a patch of ice. And, you know, I, I'd never driven in, well, I guess I'd driven in Nebraska, but probably not drunk. I wasn't drunk when I was in Nebraska, but I mean, my car spun out and I went over one of those medians. And I remember like thinking, okay, God, if, if like, please, please don't let my tires be flat. Like I can't go to jail for this. And I got out and all four of my tires were fine. And I got back in my car and I drove home, you know, but in that moment I was like, oh, if you just let me be okay. Like I learned my lesson. I didn't No, you know, the party went on. Sure. I did. Um, so after about 19 months there, I did come home again because <laughs> I thought, well, if I just get out of here and go back to Houston, I'll be okay. And I did come back to Houston and I did go back to AA at that point. So I reached out to some friends that I had known in young people's AA and I started going to meetings again. Okay. So How long did it last? About a year. Stayed sober about a year okay. and picked up a boyfriend. He was a really good guy. He was actively working a program. And then I met my first husband through him. So <laughs> my first husband had been his sister's prom date. So the guy that he was living with was friends with my first husband and we met at their house and then whatever. One thing led to another. Him and I broke up, ended up with the other guy and um, he was actually a normie. So I decided like I, I can drink, like I can drink with him and his friends. And I remember making that conscious decision. I like remember being in that bar with them and I was watching them and they didn't drink like the people I drank with. And I was like, okay, this is going to be okay. Like I can be a part of this group and it's going to be okay. And I truly believe that. And it, it actually was for a while, you know, it, it actually was for a while, maybe not all the time. Like there were periods where it wasn't, but usually I hid those from him. And then, you know, then I would get normal again. And, and, you know, we ended up going, I ended up going out to Los Angeles. I had been trying to get into the um, American Academy of Dramatic Arts since I was like 17 and it's really hard to get an audition. So I finally got an audition. I was like 20 years old. No, I wasn't. I was 21 years old, 22 years old. And I, I I made it. I was like one of the two people that made it from Houston that year or from Texas that year, actually. So I ended up going out to Los Angeles and, you know, this was going to be great. And I'm going to be a movie star or a, a theater star or whatever. And I, and I went to Chili's and got a job. <laughs> worked at Chili's a lot. It was real easy. I was like, hey, can I work here again? They're like, OK. And started going out and drinking with people after work again. I was able to maintain, like I was able to be in school. I was able to pay my bills. I was able to stay drunk pretty much most nights. Marijuana was a big, I was never really a pot smoker, but marijuana was a big thing out there because there was a lot of Canadians at our school. And for some <laughs> reason they smoke weed. So yeah. that was like the thing. Okay. We go to school, we go smoke weed. We learn our lines. We rehearse our dances or our songs. I go to work, I drink after work, I go home and then get up and go to school the next day. So I did that for a while. And then my first husband ended up moving out to California with me. And lo and behold, Gage was created. Yes. <laughs> and the party came screeching to a halt. So I was out in LA and I did get to finish my first year, but I was pregnant and, you know, we decided we're going to come home because it was super expensive to live out there. And, and there was a grandbaby and a baby coming now. And I was like, this was going to be cool. Like I was going to be a mom and, you know, this is what I really wanted. So we came back to Houston and I was really able to maintain, like I, I quit drinking, I quit smoking. 
had a baby, got married, bought a house and did all of those things. And I went back to school. I ended up um, getting a scholarship to College of the Mainland. They had a really good theater program. And I was able to go right into that from the academy. And, you know, things were good for probably two years. And then we started trying to get pregnant again. And I had a little bit of problem with that. And so kind of sunk into a depression and started drinking and, you know, finally did get pregnant with Reese after some (laughs) fertility drugs and did great, put everything down again. And then as soon as she was born, I just went off to the races. I mean, I, I remember the first time I went out after she was born, I finally pumped enough breast milk and I was like, okay, I'm going to go out. Here's, here's your kids. Here's the breast milk freezers full. And I went out with the intention of getting drunk. Like there was enough milk for me to drink that night for the baby to have breast milk the next day until I could pump all of it. Like I had, like, I thought about it. Like I yep. planned it, you know, like I'm going to pump the alcohol out of my system, but that was the intention. And I, you know, I went out and I did it. And so that slowly started that cycle of just the alcoholism getting out of control. So the math, when did okay, the math, so, come the math. so once I started the spiral with that alcoholism, you know, my marriage started falling apart. It was already kind of falling apart before this, you know, I just thought if I had another kid or bought another house or bought a bigger car, it would somehow get better, but it didn't. And so I made the decision to leave the marriage. And I, so I, I moved out and I found myself lo and behold in this biker bar one night. And I thought I was going to do a line of cocaine, which wasn't a big deal, whatever, like I've done it before. Right. And turns out it was crystal meth. And it was, you know, I laugh now because at the time I really had no idea what I was doing. I really didn't. I had no idea what crystal meth was. I thought it was speed. You know, after they told me it was meth, I was like, oh, it's just speed. You know, like I didn't, I couldn't, I didn't have any clue that there was like an epidemic or like it was so highly addictive or anything. And I thought it was like the greatest thing ever because I didn't want to stay in bed anymore. You know, I'd been sleeping a lot because I was depressed about the divorce. I'm a single mom, had been a stay at home mom, like didn't (laughs) just getting back out into the world. Um, I sold 12 houses that month. I was in real estate. I was like, this is the best stuff ever. Like my house is spotless. I'm out of bed. I'm selling houses left and right. Like this is amazing. And and I really believed that. And I thought that, you know, and, and it wasn't until it wasn't slowly, but surely like the people I surrounded myself with changed, you know, and I got into a relationship with husband number two, who was a ex biker. Like that was the world he came from. And so I found myself like going from being a stay at home soccer mom to like in this crazy, crazy world of like bikers and, and biker girls. And like, like it was just, it was so surreal to me, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and after a few months, you know, like I was off the chain, you know, my ex-husband took the kids, you know, he took primary custody of the kids and I just couldn't pull myself out of it. Like I was just, I was in this spiral. And so I decided that I was going to have another kid because <laughs> I, I knew that I knew that the the new guy couldn't possibly take take custody of a kid because he could barely take care of himself. And, and so I decided to have Asher, who was my third child. And um, I did good. You know, I, I was able to quit, not at the beginning of the pregnancy, but after a few weeks. And I stayed sober for almost the first year of his life. But again, you know, I was in this toxic relationship where like I tried to stay sober. He had no intention of staying sober. I would, I would be okay for a while. Then he would come back. I would use, and I was just so terrified of losing him in that relationship that I just, I just kept going. What were some of the solutions that you were able to focus on and what kind of pulled you out of that? Cause certainly in the beginning, having three kids, I mean, having a one baby, then another baby. Now you're at your third. Was it something there that pulled you out of it? Was yeah. it just that you were tired? Where did you get that? Well, it, it, it was a lot of it was Asher. You know, I got real dark real fast from there. You know, I found myself selling drugs, found myself involved with some really scary people and I couldn't get myself out of it and was brought to my attention that the FBI was watching me. And I got really scared. Like, like I, I just remember being in fear. It was like, no matter how much I wanted to get out of it. I couldn't like, you know, even, even when I would go to sleep, like somebody would be knocking on my door and like, it just, there was no way out. I really truly believe there was no way out. I 
remember, I will never forget the morning I asked for help. I was on my bathroom floor and I was crying because I had been trying to stop using and I was so tired and I couldn't take care of Asher. And, you know, I I remember saying, God, I want to die, but I don't want to die. And for some reason that day, I picked up my phone and I texted my mom and I said, I'm not doing good. I need you. I need you to come get me and the baby. And so that night my sister showed up, you know, I was scared I was going to go to jail too. Like, I'm going to be honest. Like I knew that it would devastate Gage and race. I knew that they would never forgive me for that. And you know, who was going to take care of Asher? He had two parents that were addicts and it was just, it came down to like, it's either do or die calling. Like either you're going to go, you're going to take this to the bitter end, or you're going to try and pull yourself out of this. My sister showed up that night and she took Asher. She went and got me some soup. And then my mom showed up the next day. There was all sorts of chaos going on at my house. Like I had just gotten in a huge fight with my then boyfriend, packed all his stuff up. Like he was furious because I was using and he had been gone for a while and he came back and I was supposed to be sober, but that didn't happen. And so my mom like walks into my house and there's just drugs everywhere and paraphernalia everywhere. And he's telling my mom, like she's, she's doing this, this, and this, and she's involved with, you know, this biker group and the FBI is watching her and all this stuff. And my mom is just looking at me like, are you kidding me right now? And she said, do you need to go to treatment? And I said, yeah. And so um, two days later, I was put on a plane and flown up to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I spent 33 days at the Karen Foundation in Warnersville, Pennsylvania. I know it sounds weird because a lot of people struggle with cravings and triggers and all of that. I, I really was just so grateful it was over. Like that was the thought I had. I remember waking up a week. I was a week sober when I got there. And I just remember being so grateful that it was finally all over. And, you know, so I did something different this time. I I didn't get a boyfriend, (laughs) got through treatment without a boyfriend, got out with a really solid discharge plan. Like I came back to Houston and I I was already enrolled in IOP at a a facility in Houston. Um, I already had a list of meetings and I got to, I got home on a Friday night. My mom got there on a Saturday. On the Sunday, I went to my first meeting and I I remember pulling up to the treatment center and like sitting in the car and I was like, oh, I can't go in here. I can't go in here. And then that voice in my head going, either you go in here or you use again and it's all over. And so I got out of the car and I walked into the meeting and it was a women's meeting. And um, when I walked in, there was someone in the meeting that I had worked with prior to moving to LA that I actually drank with all the time. And she's like, Colleen. And I, you know, I said her name and we both kind of laughed because we were always the ones that shut the bar down and we're like, Oh yeah, that makes sense. But I, you know, I know that God put her there for a reason because she invited me out with, she had a group of friends and they had a couple of years sober and three years sober and five years sober. And she kept asking me to go out with them until I finally said, yes, it was a couple, a couple of weeks. And so here, all of a sudden I had this built-in support system of women that to this day, I consider my tribe, you know? Right. And for you, that was way different, right? Like, cause you were somebody that, you know, kind of found yourself in relationships versus really kind of embracing the sisterhood of the recovery community. It, yeah. And it was crazy. Like I knew that I couldn't do the relationships this time. Like that was one thing I remember telling myself, like I, I went so far as I didn't even get a phone number from a single guy in the program. Like every phone number I had was just from a woman. I kept that going for probably two or three years. Like it just, I told myself, you can't do it. Like you can't do it. You have to stick with the women. And it was super uncomfortable. And I was, I have, I was so full of shame, like so full of shame. Like I remember like the first couple of weeks I wouldn't go to dinner with them. It was because these women were like, one of them was like a preacher's wife. And like the, like they were so to me, like looking at them, I was like, what are they going to think about me? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a mom who was addicted to crystal meth and selling drugs out of my house. Like, how can I even sit at the table with them? You know, and that's where, and how did you, I just did it because I knew if I didn't, I was going to use, you know, and I knew that the only way that I could get from the place of being that person to being the mom, I you know, I was supposed to be and the mom I knew I was capable of and the mom I had been at some point was to sit in these uncomfortable situations and um, to do the work. So I got a sponsor and, it, you know, it was funny. I, I It was very hard for me. I looked for a long time and I, I didn't want to leave IOP. And after like 100 days, my counselor's like, OK, your dad says you have to go out into the world now and you need to get a sponsor. And so I found somebody that had really cool hair and a great tattoo and um, talked about being a woman of integrity. And I was like, that's so cool. That's what I want to be. 
And she took me through the 12 steps and, you know, everything changed. I, I remember, and, and that was something different for me. I had never done that before. Like I never followed the whole plan. Like I did bits and I did pieces, but I never did the whole thing. And so here I was, I, I did my year of aftercare. I did relapse prevention two nights a week. I did meetings four nights a week. I had a sponsor. I worked the steps. I met with other women. I, I, I called other people. I developed relationships with other women in recovery. And, you know, I, I just remember being so, I was like six months sober. And I remember walking out into my family room and like my kids were asleep in these forts, like in the family room. And I just remember bursting into tears because a year prior to that, I had my kids in their rooms and people coming in and out of my house, picking things up, dropping things off, you know, and, and, and like, I just, the, just the reality of like, oh my God, my house is a home, you know, like this is my home. This is my kid's home and there's nothing else going on here. And just having so much gratitude. And I, I would get so excited. Like every time I hit like a sobriety, you know, anniversary, I'd be like, oh my God, I'm still sober. Like, I can't believe I'm still sober. Because I, I think in the end, I truly thought that I was going to die that way. Like I thought this was it. There was no way I was going to get out of this. It was, I was too far, too deep. So I had so much gratitude for just being sober. And I, I still feel that way. You know, I still, there's times I talk to my friends on the way to work or at night and I hang up the phone and I just get so excited that I have the friends I have today. Like, I think it's so cool that I have the people in my life that I have in my life. That's so cool. Now we're going to switch gears a little bit. Okay. And I'm going to ask you some questions, rapid fire, and then just answer. So what is your favorite sound? Laughter, children laughing. And what's your least favorite sound? Children screaming. (laughs) All right. What vocation do you think you would have loved to have a go at if it wasn't doing what you're doing right now? I would have liked to have been a lawyer. I actually gave it a lot of thought. No, no, I am. I, I actually gave a lot of thought to going to law school. Interesting. Uh, okay. During undergrad. So what vocation do you see yourself loathing? Like, would you just loathe if you had to do every day? Oh God. Um, I, I would hate, <laughs> that's the flip side. I would hate to do law. Like my sister does. She likes, does some weird law where it's like real estate law. And I was just like, why would you pick that? Like, it's just so boring. She writes contracts all day long. So I think something like that or being a CPA. Cause I hate numbers would be okay. probably my nightmare job. And what turns you on? Intelligence, kindness, honesty. What turns you off? Dishonesty, um, selfishness, self-righteousness. And assuming there's, yeah, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. So assuming there's a God, when you die, what would you like to hear come out of God's mouth? Ooh, that's a hard one. Um, I would like to hear him say, thank you for doing my work. Thank you for showing up and, and, and serving others. Colleen, one of the things that I think is truly amazing about what you do is how you connect with other women and particularly how you connect with other women around their issues with their children and their recovery. So you're just such a big advocate for moms in recovery. And it's just beautiful to see. And I, when you told that story about the forts, I totally pictured it and and the gratitude that you have today, you know, and, and what that feels like. So I, I know our listeners can definitely relate to that. We're going to move into the positive intervention portion of our call today. And so, and really what, what this with this one, it's like perfect for you because I know how much freedom you found. I have the privilege of knowing and working with you for quite a few years. And so I, I love that piece. But so today's quote um, is, no man is free who is not master of himself. Is freedom anything else than the power of living as we choose? Addictive drugs and behaviors were at one time effective tools for recovering addicts. They helped them feel better and enabled them to escape discomfort. Once those addictive substances and behaviors stopped working, it was too late to make any adjustments. Once activated, addiction is not a disease that spontaneously goes away. Addiction is a process whereby unsuspecting people's hijacked brains enslave them. Unknowingly, they invite the terrorists right into their bodies. From the moment their free will is overthrown, they are not their own masters. They lose their freedom. So today's positive intervention is make a list of how your freedom was stolen from you during your act of addiction. Next to it, make a list of the freedoms that you enjoy today. What are you doing now that you only dreamed of doing before? 
What positive, healthy habits are you able to do today? What are your sources of joy? When complete, compare these lists and take the time to savor the gifts of freedom. Remember also to make one new friend today. (laughs) So, I mean, really with this positive intervention, as I was prepping for our podcast, I was like, oh my God, this is so Colleen. So how was this for you? What what experience did you have? It was really good. Um, You know, when I, when I was able, because truthfully I lost all my freedoms, like I didn't have any choice left. I didn't have, I wasn't the mom I wanted to be. I didn't love myself. I didn't respect myself. I couldn't take care of myself. Um, And so this was easy when I got to put down the freedoms that I have today, you know, like I have a career that I love and I, I'm able to be vulnerable today which is something that I can't remember ever being able to do. And, and and it didn't come overnight. Like that took some work, right? And to believe in myself and to know my own worth, you know, and to have faith, like I can set goals now and I know that I'm going to achieve them. Whereas before it would be like, oh, I can't do that because there's no way I'm going to finish it, you know? And, and that even, no matter how hard things get, I know I'm going to be okay. And I know that I have the capability of, of reaching my goals. So you know, that, that was, that was a cool one. Like I, I was excited to do that one. Cause I could, like, I could just close my eyes and see the difference between what it was and what it's like now and, and, and everything that I've gained from recovery. What do you tell people in treatment? Cause you, you work at an inpatient residential treatment center, positive recovery centers. What do you tell someone when they say, I can't picture my life any different? You know, I, I tell them that. So I usually, I, at that point, like, I go to a picture. I really do. And I, and I point at like a dot and I said, you see this dot right here? Like that's where you're at right now. Like you're just in the dot and you can't see the whole picture right now. All you see is the dot, but, but you know, there's this beautiful life ahead for you, you know, and and you just have to have faith that if you do the right thing and you do the work on yourself, that like, this is going to be a beautiful portrait. It is hard for people to see. You know, they can only see, like, they just see, I know for me, I just saw this mountain, like, oh my God, you're asking me to do all this stuff, you know? And if, if we can really just work with people and remind them, you just have to do what's in front of you. Like just take one little step, then take the next little step and take the next little step that it becomes easier. And, And before you know it, you know, you're, you're way up here and you're not really sure how you got there. You just did it like one step at a time. What's the best part of your recovery? My relationships for sure my friendships, the relationship I have with my significant other today, the relationship I have with my children and my family today, my career. You know, I, I, I I tell the clients all the time, you know, like addiction can either be like a curse and a nightmare, or it can be the greatest gift you've ever had. And like, you get to pick which way you want to look at it. You know, for me, I, I see my addiction as a gift because if I had not walked through what I went through, if I had not experienced what I experienced, I wouldn't be the counselor I am today. I wouldn't be the mother I am today. I wouldn't be the friend I am today. Um, And and all of that is a gift of my addiction and my recovery. I wouldn't get to live in recovery today if I didn't have to live in addiction. And and, and so they they kind of go hand in hand for me. Thanks. And I know with this positive intervention that there was just so many things that when I was going through it and knowing that you were doing this particular one, that it it was going to have a lot of meaning and meaning that I know that you'll continue to share with, with our clients at Positive Recovery. Just share with us and our listeners, what was the best suggestion that you've received in recovery? Okay. So the best suggestion was to take care of myself first. And I couldn't wrap my head around that. And we were just talking about this today in group. Like I couldn't wrap my head around, like I had to be okay in order for everything else in my life to be okay. And it's so true, you know, and, and, you know, people talk about the airplane mask comes down and you got to put your own mask on first. But in order for me to show up for everybody else the way I needed to, I had, I had to be well and I had to take care of myself. Um, So that's the best piece of advice I ever got aside from working on building that relationship with my higher power, because it all really starts there for me. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Colleen, for sharing a bit of yourself today with us and a bit of Positive Recovery Center's Hill Country. So glad to have you on our team and on our podcast today. I will be signing out for Dr. Jason Powers and myself for Positive Recovery MD, and we look forward to hearing and seeing others on the next episode. Thank you for listening to this episode of Positive Recovery MD. Don't forget to visit PositiveRecoveryMD.com to sign up to get your daily positive intervention sent straight to your inbox. Be sure to subscribe to Positive Recovery MD on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts to receive an automatic download when a new episode drops. And as always, if you or someone you know needs help, 
visitpositiverecovery.com or call 877-4-SOBRIETY, which is 877-476-2743. We are here to help.